been in company while he was uh, recovering from his various uh, situations. It wasn't bad, but it's better than some of the other people in this country, but uh, it's no saint, that's for sure. Okay, so um, you got to go under the underbelly of history, you know? you got to pick up the rocks and look at the worms underneath the rocks and things like that. You can't just go by, oh, Kennedy, oh, Roosevelt, oh, you know, and, oh, horrible Bush, and so on and so forth. You, you got to pick up the rock and look, look down under and see what these guys are really making these people tick. Sometimes, uh, or Wilson's a perfect example, another one. Uh, uh, particularly where the Afro-American problem is concerned, Wilson was just disgusting. Racial attitudes. Total bigot. Anyway, yeah, he liked the, the movie uh, The Birth of a Nation by, uh, who was that guy that made that movie uh, about the Ku Klux Klan? He, he thought that was a good movie, Wilson did. Um, yeah. Anyway, let's go back to this situation here. Is he being sarcastic here in this essay? Absolutely. He's just uh, full of sarcasm. And what's the sarcasm directed on? These uh, people who are carried away by their enthusiasm, what's wrong with being carried away by enthusiasm? If there is enthusiasm, it means it'll get people, will help get things done. Why would you heap abuse, scorn on people's excitement uh, because these people are coming from the West? There's been a revolution in the world. I emphasize that they've given the cause itself a new name. This is sarcasm. I'm giving it to you so you see it. You might not get it when you read it. It's no longer love of Zion. Hibat Zion, that means love of Zion. But now it's Zionism, Zionism. Zion, you okay. So now we've got Zionism, not Hibat Zion. Indeed, there are even precisionists who, being determined to leave no loophole for error, use only the European form of the name, Zionismus. Thus announcing to all and somebody that are talking about anything as antiquated as Hibat Zion, the former movement that we have already uh, talked about. Um, there was another name, by the way, that I forgot to mention when we were talking about Hibat Zion. They had a, um, another acronym that they had. They were often called the BILU. And that's an acronym of four Hebrew words, starting with the B-I-L-U, and that's based on, in English, um, come Israel, let us go. And it is Bo, which is come Israel, leku ba, let's go. So they were called the Bilo, the Bilu movement of the Hibat Zion movement before the Herzl pair, the ones who started the kibbutz movements and all that sort of thing. That was already going on when Herzl um, was, was starting to write. But the Nights and All and Sunday, they're not talking about anything so antiquated as Hibat Zion, but about a new up-to-date movement which comes like its name from the West where people are innocent of the Hebrew language. You see the scorn there? They only speak German and French and English, you know, uh, they don't know Hebrew, so, so he's mocking them. They're, so, they're big shots, but they don't even know any Hebrew. Which most Reformed Judy the Jews, people I knew, for instance, are, were in that school. They didn't know Hebrew at all. Nordau, when we read Nordau's address, on the general condition of the Jews was a sort of introduction to the business of the conference, Congress. It described in incisive language the sore troubles, material or spiritual, which beset Jews the world over. In Eastern countries, we heard read it, their trouble was material, etc. They must struggle without let up to satisfy the elementary physical needs. Again, he's mocking it a little bit. In the, because they're, which is denied them in the West, in lands where the Jews are legally emancipated, their material condition is not so bad, but their spiritual state is serious. Et cetera, et cetera. He's sort of, we read Nordau's speech a bit, and you've read it fully, I hope. Well, so that's why we read it, so you could compare it. So what then? 
Nornow himself did not touch on this question, which was outside the scope of his address. Yeah, what about the spiritual need? He's interested in the spiritual need. That's not bad. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that in decent times when you have plenty of time to deal with a couple of centuries in front of you to uh, address those needs. But the whole conf Congress was his answer. The answer, begin beginning as it did with Nordau's address. The Congress meant this, that in order to escape from all these troubles, it's necessary to establish a Jewish state. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. If you want to escape the Holocaust, now that we know, this is what you have to do. But not, not Haram. He wants to rescue their soul first. You know, he starts talking about the nephesh, the soul, at the beginning of the previous state. But you see, the problem is, there's no doubt that when a Jewish state is established, Jewish settlement only advanced by small degrees, as permitted by the resources of the people themselves, and by the progress of the economic development of the country, and so he's showing, always looking the downside. What are the problems here? In his opening speech at the Congress, Dr. Herzl wished to demonstrate the superiority of his state idea to the previous form of Palestinian colonization, calculating that by the latter method it would take 900 years for all the Jews to be settled there. And look what he said. But it was a cheap victory. See, it, of course, scorn on Herzl, which is fine, but the point is Herzl's only got good motives. Why would you pour scorn on <coughs> What in your mindset would make you pour scorn on, his, on, on what he's trying to do? It's a cheap figure. In fact, it, it, Herzl was right. He could have solved these things if he was given, uh, you know, the wherewithal to do it. If guys like him, Adam and others hadn't defeated him at the Congress, I love that uh, The Jewish state itself, do what it will, will find no way to make a more favorable calculation. Well, you see, he's wrong. They have six million Jews in Israel even now, or five million Jews in Israel or so now, and it's only about a um, hundred years after these discussions here, and uh, that's including the Holocaust. So, you know, you could have maybe uh, 10 or 12 million there. Nobody would be able to deal with them with those numbers. We must admit to ourselves, the truth is bitter. And Weissman's the same. With all its bitterness, it's better than an illusion. You see, this is why I, I'm really not very pleased with these people. Because you see, this is the mindset of Eastern Europe. The truth is bitter. You know, whites will have the same mindset. We must admit to ourselves that the ingathering of the exiles is unattainable by natural means. Oh, no, we can't do it. We must have miracles, religious means. Not by natural means, you see. To establish a Jewish state, maybe that will be possible. Uh, but the greater part of people are going to remain scattered on foreign soil. Well, that's not true. <laughs> that's not what happened. Uh, to gather the scattered ones from the four corners of the earth, like the prophets talk about, is impossible. So he's saying he represents the prophetical religion. He doesn't at all. Prophetical religion in Isaiah, in uh, Jeremiah, in Ezekiel is all for the uh, gathering from the four, four corners, corners. To the east, I will say, give them up. To the west, I will say, hold not back, and so on and so that my people come from the ends of the earth, etc., 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 etc. Ezekiel is the great prophet of this. So we've got to worry about the diaspora. We can't worry about the little Jewish state, the ingathering of the exiles. That can only be a small part of our people. See, he's defeated before he starts. So, I mean, if you think I would misplace my critique of him, uh, you know, it's, I don't know what to make of it. I, I'm, I'm just totally stunned by this kind of writing. Whether or not we create a Jewish state, the material situation of the Jews will always basically depend on the economic condition and the cultural level of the various nations among, among which we are dispersed. He doesn't see the Holocaust coming. He has no idea of the precarious situation of the Jewish people. He doesn't understand what's in the mind of the Western countries. He didn't look at the Dreyfus trial. He's living in a bubble. And history has shown that to be the case. Am I wrong? I mean, <laughs> we can see it. 
Oh, it's very noble to be interested in spiritual things. And as my friend who left uh, early uh, feels and realizes, okay, fine, yes, there's nothing. No one's going to criticize you for being interested in cultural and spiritual things. But when you don't see the real spirit of the times, if you want to call that, and don't see the, the tragedy awaiting, then you're actually um, um, deceiving yourself and your people in some way. Anyway, the spiritual problem appears in two different forms, one in the West, one in the East, which explains the fundamental difference between Western Zionism, and you probably didn't know we are going to get into this stuff in this literature, and Eastern hip hop Zionism. Nor now not only with the Western form of the problem, apparently knowing nothing about the Eastern and the Congress as a whole, cuts down on the first and paid little attention to the second. You see, you know, he says that, that it's the, you know, the Eastern situation that we have to deal with and um, so on and so forth. He has already grown accustomed to 265 in the first paragraph at the top there. A broader social and political life on the intellectual side of work to be done for our Jewish national culture does not attract him because the culture has played no part in his earliest education. Basically, I think he's talking here about the westernized Jew he's talking about. Um, in this dilemma, he turns to the land of his ancestors and imagines how good it would be if a Jewish state were established there. Then he could live a full and complete life within his own people. Well, what's wrong with that? Oh no, that's not Jewish enough for uh, Mr. Uh, um, and Mr. Weitzman. And these the leaders, with these kind of leaders, you see again, Hitler is, uh, is, a, is an insane, uh, fanatical maniac. But uh, with this kind of leadership, they're not going to survive the Hitler. Of course, not all the Jews will be able to take wing and go to their state, but the very existence of the Jewish state will also raise the prestige of those who remain in exile. So the state will help us all everywhere. As he, that's true, that's happened. As he further contemplates this fascinating vision, it suddenly dawns on his inner conscience that even now, before the Jewish state is established, the mere idea of it gives him almost complete relief. So the Western Jew, the Herzl guy, oh, it's just the idea. And he did say that in his notebooks, you know, that he, the idea itself excited him. That's the basis of Western science. And the secret of its attraction. He's jealous, too. Uh, Ahara Armas jealous. He calls himself one of the people, a little bit pretentious, I would say. But Eastern Hibbat Zion originated and developed in a different setting. It, too, began, began as a political movement, but being a, a, a result of material evils, it could not be content with activity consisting only of outbursts of feeling and fine phrases. It expressed itself in concrete activities, okay, that's fair enough, in the establishment of colonies in Palestine, the practical Zionism. This practical work soon clipped the wings of fancy and demonstrated conclusively that Abbas Zion could not lessen the material woe of the Jews one iota. One might therefore have thought that when the fact became patent, the Hovave Zion, Hovave Zion, it's the same uh, root as Hibbat Zion. Hova Bey are the people who do Hibbat Zion, the lovers of Zion. Hova Bey means lovers of Zion. We give up their effort and cease wasting time and energy on work which brought them no nearer their goal. But no, they remained true to the flag and went on working with the old enthusiasm that most of them did not understand, even in their own minds, why they did so. For at the very time when the material tragedy in the East was at its height, the heart of Eastern Jews was sensitive to another tragedy, a spiritual one. And when the hope of Zion began to work for the solution of the material problem, the national instinct of the people felt that in this work it would find the remedy for its spiritual trouble. The Eastern form of the spiritual problem is absolutely different from the Western. In the West is the problem of the Jews, in the East is the problem of Judaism. So here we go. The first weighs on the individual, the second on the nation. So his main interest is Judaism. One is a product of anti-Semitism and is dependent on anti-Semitism. The other is a natural product of the real link from a millennial culture. So he's interested in upgrading Judaism and so on. Judaism, next page, is therefore in a quandary. It can no longer tolerate the galut. Okay. 267, Galut means exile, diaspora, Galut, uh, from which it had to take on in its obedience, its will to live. 
For this purpose, Judaism can further down for the present content itself with little. We don't have to ask. We don't need an independent state there. We don't need political funds. We don't need an independent state. When the British get to the point 15 years later of offering us something, we don't need and demand to be a total you know, independent state. Only the creation of its native land of conditions favorable to its development. The Jewish settlement which will be a gradual growth. Okay, okay, that's fine. But uh, he doesn't understand the, the world he's living in. Then from this center, the spirit of Judaism will radiate out. So we'll have a cultural center that will radiate out this great culture, which never has happened in Israel even now. There's no culture radiating out of Israel at all. <laughs> even with five million people there. <laughs> and certainly never was from agricultural settlements. He's just living in a dream world, which is noble, it's a fine dream, but it's only unreal dream. Sounds good. Sounds good. Will confuse a lot of people. Now we have the, unfortunately, uh, they say uh, hindsight is twenty twenty. We have the vision of hindsight to show us. Then from the center, the spirit of Judaism will ready to radiate out. Oh yes, I wish it had happened. This hypothesis in the next paragraph, which concerns itself with the preservation of Judaism at a time when Jewry is suffering so much as something odd and unintelligible to the political Zionisms. Just as in a man of Rabbi Yochanan, here we go, the great hero. <laughs> I didn't even have to predict it. I could have told you. I didn't even know we were coming to it. Just as in a man of Rabbi Yochanan ben Sakai for Yavne was strange and un unintelligible to the comparable party of his time. There we go. Zionism cannot satisfy those Jews who care for Judaism. So, okay, great. Uh, Judaism is what he cares for, okay, but stand out of the way of the others who want to save the people. Well, he goes on like that. Next paragraph. But a political idea which is not grounded in our national culture is apt to seduce us from loyalty to our own inner spirit. Okay. So, end of that paragraph on 268. So that in the end, the Jewish state will be a state of Germans or Frenchmen of the Jewish race. I don't know really care if that's the case personally and Israel is very much like that in my Tel Aviv I mean they just ate Western ways particularly European ways France and so on sitting in cafes and the, you know etc 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 so uh, it, 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 that's the way people are but uh, if we can save them that's all that matters to me they let them live the way they want that's their business how they want to live they want to live like Frenchmen and, Fre and Germans, so do we. We want to live like Americans. Everybody wants to live modern. I mean, this guy is like in some other universe. 269, and he's calling himself a Zionist. This is cultural Zionist. So we shall really, 269, be then much more than we are now, a small and insignificant nation, enslaved in spirit to the favored fortune, turning an envious and covetous eyes on the armed force of our powerful neighbors, this guy's got it all wrong. Our existence in such terms as sovereign state would not add a glorious chapter to our national history. <laughs> That's exactly wrong. That's the, oh, just the opposite occurred. Just the opposite occurred. Even with a few, oh, 500,000 people, hardly anything in 1948. And they didn't turn an envious eye to their powerful neighbors. They fought to establish a state and survive. And it's a glorious chapter in the history of the Jewish people, and everyone recognizes it as such. And he is out in, you know, left field somewhere. Would it not be better for an ancient people, which was once a beacon of the world, to disappear than to be reaching such a goal as this? Yes, we should disappear rather than uh, do it uh, in this other way. In some about Zion, it is a thought of hiding. In some about Zion, no less than Zionism wants a Jewish state and believes in the possibility of the establishment of a Jewish state in the future sometime. But Zionism looks to the Jewish state to furnish a remedy for poverty and provide complete tranquility and national glory. About Zion knows that our state will not give us all these things uh, until universal righteousness is enthroned and holds sway over all nations and states. Uh, you know, universal righteousness is someday going to come and solve all these problems. <laughs> It looks to a Jewish state to provide only a secure refuge for Judaism. Yeah, that's why Weitzman demanded of the British only a homeland, not a state. And we don't, you don't know that. The world doesn't know that. 
and Judaism and a cultural bond unite our nation. Zionism therefore began its work with political propaganda. But Zion begins with national culture. It sounds a bit like fascism there, because only through the national culture of forsaken and Jewish state be established in such a way as to correspond with the will and needs of the Jewish people. Wow, 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 wow. Okay, you can read the next essay yourself. I think we've got enough of that to understand where he's coming from, and it's shockingly surprising in view of the historical situation. That would be fine maybe in the Middle Ages sometime. Or maybe uh, 500 years from now when the Arabs are not trying to annihilate <laughs> to the whole world or something like that. Or Islam is not trying to drop a nuclear bomb on everybody or whatever. But uh, we, you know, it's, uh, let's look at Weizmann. <laughs> Weizmann is funny. You see, the Arabs think that the um, the British made the Balfour Declaration to the Jews. The Balfour Declaration was where at the, at the height of World War One, as I told you, when the British campaign into Palestine from Egypt was taking shape. I don't know if you saw Lawrence of Arabia, but if you did, you'll see what it's, some of what it's about. That's 1917. They knew they were going in. They also knew that Brandeis was a very big Zionist. And they wanted to bring the Americans into the war in 1917 if they could, and they knew Brandeis had Wilson's ear, and they knew that if they could, you know, make the Jews some promises, it would uh, it would help the war effort because they were going to take Jerusalem. They knew they were going to take Jerusalem. They they did. They 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 rolled through Jerusalem, went on into uh, Syria and Lawrence of Arabia. How many have seen that movie? Haven't seen Lawrence of Arabia. It's a crummy movie, but it's a classic. Uh, I mean, it's not all of it is uh, highly romanticized. Uh, it's not the real story, but it's at least an attempt to do that story. Ends in Damascus with Lawrence uh, and the Arab revolt uh, and uh, Emir Faisal and the people from uh, Mecca going up to uh, Damascus, and then the French and the British throwing them out of there. And Lawrence feeling like he betrayed his promises <coughs> to them for the revolt. Um, so anyway, Weitzman went to the Zionist Congresses. He did a scientific study in Switzerland. He decided to move to England. I think um, he was born in the middle of uh, some Polish-Russian area, Pins. And he moved to England in 1904, which was the year of Herzl's death. If you recall. He got on to the University of Manchester faculty. And then he helped produce some chemical uh, which was uh, vital for naval gunpowder. But uh, that's not why the British made the Balfour Declaration, because Weizmann helped in, in their chemical research. He was no Einstein just worked on one of the last, but the Arab propaganda is that the, the Jews got Palestine because Weizmann, uh, in return for Weizmann's work for the British government. It's just nonsense. The British aren't that childish in what they do. They don't really uh, give gifts for reasons like that. <laughs> he was a delegate at the Second Zionist Congress in 1898. And he was never really sympathetic to Herzl. But he, in England, he made a lot of contacts, 574, uh, in England. And he was the one involved in the negotiations in London, which led to the Balfour Declaration. And then he became the head of the Zionist movement. He became the first president of the state of Israel. He was the head of the Zionist organization and so on. And of course, look at the last paragraph of 574. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you expect it? In 1920, he came into conflict with Brandeis. Why would he come in conflict with Brandeis? Well, we can already see. Brandeis was, for Herzl's view, political Zionist. Weitzman was a cultural Zionist. This is the person leading the Zionist movement after the death of Herzl. Just the wrong person in the wrong place at the wrong time. Now, I 
I don't know any Jewish person who ever meet who would say that, or who would know to say that. But you can say it on my, on, uh, <laughs> you can cite me as your, uh, as your uh, footnote for that particular point if you want. And he also had a terrible fight in the last paragraph there with Jabotinsky. And Jabotinsky, the British threw him out of Palestine. They weren't willing to live with him. He was too much of a nationalist for them. He was the real heir to Herzl. He founded organizations that became the terrorist organizations, but they weren't terrorists in his time. Uh, and um, as I said, Netanyahu's father was his secretary. Uh, well, you can read that for yourself. Here's 1914. Zionism needs living content. We know what that means. Zionism was conceived by its pioneers as a movement wholly depending on mechanical factors. There's a country that happens to be called Palestine, a country without a people, and by the way, it was pretty um, unpopulated at that time. It was a backboard of the Ottoman Empire. It wasn't populated. A lot of Zionist money went into Palestine, and that attracted a large Arab population as well as a Jewish population. So the Arabs immigration to Palestine was not kept track of because it came across land borders. The Jewish immigration came in through the, through the seaports and that was kept track of. And I'm sure there was as much Arab immigration into Palestine. You can imagine what the Middle East is like if there's a flourishing area with Western capital flowing in, they're going to come. So many Arabs came to Jews. Uh, you can look at the uh, census of those times. Um, there were, I think, 600,000 Arabs living in the land of Palestine at that time, according to the Encyclopedia Britannica of 1905. And the Jews were a majority, as I've told you, in Jerusalem. Uh, nobody knows that, but I think Jerusalem had 70,000 people, 40,000 Jews, 20,000 Muslims, 10,000 Christians. So, uh, you know, that's the way it was. You would never know that from listening to the UN debates. Sounds like the Jews came and stole the land from somebody. Um, so, anyway, let's see if there's anything we can get here. We know that living contact will mean, again, the zeitgeist, the spirit of the time, it will have to do with the spirit of Judaism. He's talking about the Uganda situation. The, when Herzl was still functioning. Uh, he's sort of laughing here about the offer the British make to Herzl of Uganda. You see, Herzl wanted to save the Jews at any price. If it meant Uganda, he would go to Uganda. If it meant the Sinai, they later proposed Sinai, he would go to Sinai. It didn't have to be that that would be the permanent place. That was a refuge as a stepping stone to ultimately, hopefully, return to Palestine if it ever became possible. But you see, Herzl already had the British government on his side in 1904 <coughs> when they made the Uganda proposal to him. I think 1903, maybe. So the same people who made the Uganda proposal to him in 1903 were in the British government in 1917, and then, that's 14 years later, they were in a position to offer Palestine. But Weizmann didn't know what to do with it, the offer they were making. And so we got a, an equivocating Balfour Declaration that speaks about founding a Jewish homeland in Palestine. It being clearly understood that nothing be done that would uh, alter the rights of the native peoples in Palestine or the Jews living in England. Well, what are you talking? That's like giving with one hand and taking back from the other. Herzl would not have accepted such a document. He wanted a clear charter. He wanted absolute promises. He, didn't, he said it in, in his speech in the Zionist Congress. Nobody, nothing should be done until a clear charter be given. We can't have people going under false promises. The British would have given him a clear charter. I know it because they offered him clear charter in Uganda. And the Jews refused it at the Zionist Congress, led by people like uh, these cultural Zionists, which is fair enough. 
understand where they're coming from. They couldn't understand that there was a tragedy waiting, that they had to get out whatever happened for the time being. So, okay, that's, that's fine. And so they took, they reveled in the fact that Herzl was a jerk and that he couldn't understand Judaism. Yeah, but he understood the Jewish national problem, you see. He may not have understood Judaism in their terms, but he understood the Jewish national problem. Maybe I'll write a book about this. Maybe I'll, you think I should write a book on this subject? Sure. You think I should? Yeah. It'd be tough. It'd be tough. People hate you because they won't understand what you're talking about. Once again, they haven't read all the texts that we've read. You can see the differences here. You, you can't just say these things out of the blue. People think you're nuts. They don't. They just think you're insane. You have to, you know, be, uh, tease them through these things with texts and stuff, which is why my books turn out to be thousand pages. You know. <laughs> you know, uh, can't write, hate someone so much who writes a thousand pages. You have to figure something to dig through there before you can hate him. You know, you're just going to put him in a, you know, you're just going to put him in a uh, pigeonhole. Okay, you can do it. But um, it'd be really tough to do this book, but maybe I'll think about it if I can. Maybe I'll take it off these tapes or something. Anyway, so. Have the Turks consented? Have they said yes? He doesn't understand. The Turks are going to lose Palestine. This is 1914, three years before it happens. He's laughing at Herzl even here. And when it appeared, the Congress had waited in vain for the pleasant news. And when after six years of work, the answer of the Turks turned out not to be yes, but no. Of course, the Turks okay. They didn't want to give Herzl what he wanted, but at least they, they listened to him. So this is the history of the mechanical movement of Zionism. Uh, even if the great miracle had occurred and we had obtained the charter in 576, we should have had to wait for the greater miracle, the Jews, to know how to make use of the charter. Well, you know, these people are all defeated before they started. So laugh at the Western Jews as much as you want, but they're not bitten by the defeatist attitude. They think that it can be done. After the Uganda crisis, most Jews realized that a people's movement cannot be created and kept in being mechanically. You know, Herzl was willing to accept Uganda from the British. Well, suppose they had accepted Uganda from the British, and the Jews had clear title and charter to it. Okay, there would have been an African problem, and ultimately they would have had to leave, and so on. But would, would Hitler have let the Jews go from Eastern Europe? Probably might have. Might have, because he wanted them to go to Madagascar, but he had no way to get them down there. Uh, I'm not saying he was a nice person. Uh, so, okay, you can go on like this and read the rest of this here at the bottom of 577. If the Zionist good fortune, it's the Zionist good fortune that they, that they are considered mad. If we were normal, we would not think of going to Palestine. But we would stay put like all normal people. So, okay, I, that's fine that they want to go to Palestine. And we Jews have not made many sacrifices yet. That's why we're only 2% of the Palestinian soil. What value there is in real sacrifice? The example the Jew from Kiev will show in his name Barsky, one of his sons, a worker, was killed in Palestine and saw it to Ghania. <coughs> Moshe Dayan came from the Ghania. That's what was his kibbutz. It's by the Sea of Galilee. It's a very big, rich kibbutz. Rich kibbutz. It's a town, basically, now. But he sends his second son to go there. And this Jew is the greatest political Zionist after Herzl was. So that's true. Let's look at this thing he says in this speech in 1927 after the Balfour Declaration has actually been offered. December 12, 1927. Listen to how he, and this is the head of the Zionist movement, the people, the person with whom the British had to negotiate. These are very good selections, actually, so why I use this book. Long years in the West cannot remain without consequences, and the British climate is cold. I have in one of my speeches declared geography is the greatest enemy of Zionism. I know very little about music. I'm a one-sided man. Oh, poor dear. For Herzl, things were easier. He did not know the workaday reality. You know, I have it tough, but he had it easy. <laughs> First, he thought of a Jewish state. 
When the Jewish state did not come off, it was the Charter. And when the Charter did not come off, it was Uganda. Just a quick way. Herzl came from the West and worked with Western conceptions and views. I unfortunately hail from Lithuania or Russia and so on. I know the Jewish people only too well, and they know me better still, and that is why I lack the wings which were given to Herzl. This guy is another laugh. Jealous, envious, defeatist. Yeah. Doesn't believe in poetry. Certainly doesn't believe in prophets. That Adam was always talking about. He came from a strange world we did not know. And we bent our knees before the eagle who had come from that world. Had Herzl been to a header, a one-room Jewish school, Never would the Jews have followed him. He charmed the Jews because he came to them from European culture. This is a great essay. I was able to achieve my task. I don't even know why I read these things to you because you probably wouldn't see all this. I was able to achieve my task through hard and sorrowful work only. Oh, it's so hard, isn't it? I'm sure it is hard, but Herzl worked himself to death. Why would you heap abuse on him? I always to have the Jews before me, I always to stand before them, it's taught me to draw in my wings, if I ever had any. Herzl became a Palestine Zionist the moment the Kishinev delegation said no at the Uganda conference. What happened there had been a pogrom, a massacre in this town called Kishinev, and when they had the Congress, Herzl of course would have thought that the Kishinev people would have voted yes for his Uganda proposal that the British had offered him. And <laughs> they voted no. The vote was by name. My late father voted yes. I voted after him. No. Then the names of the two delegates from Kishinev were called and both said, low, no. Poor Herschel grew pale. And then he became a true Zionist. Yes, and that, that killed him. He died the next year. And then he resolved upon becoming practical work in the country, even if slowly, even if only symbolically. I can remember Herzl saying after the vote, I do not understand. The rope is around our necks and still they say no. Yes, the rope was and still is around our necks and yet we still say no. For we know very well the same British government would make us another offer. And they in fact have made that offer. Yes, but Herzl laid the groundwork for that offer. He doesn't acknowledge that. Who got the British government to even consider these things? Balfour was in the government in 1904 that made that, uh, that offer. Lloyd George, too, the Prime Minister, was in that government that made the offer. You know, so when they got Palestine, they were willing to offer Palestine. But they would have made a better offer than the one he's talking about, because Herzl would have, would have charmed them and done the work necessary to get it done properly. That is clear charter, clear title. Not a two, not a, 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 a double, uh, two-tongued uh, Offer like if you read the Balfour Declaration, maybe we have it here. I think I brought it here. One, two. I'm falling behind. I, I got too uh, excited about the uh, poor Ahada. Uh, what I said, you want to make a piece of paper, somebody, and put the date and time of this course. I don't know what I did with all those. I have a file someplace, but I can't find it at the moment. See if I can find this here. Um, where is it? Uh, let's see, mandate for Palestine, manifesto, anti-Uganda resolution, Bauer Declaration 458. Okay, I've got it here in this book. This is quite a good collection too, but it'll be on our ability to this course like this. Here it is. Written to Lord Rothschild in England as a representative of the Jewish people, supposedly, because he's the richest Jew in the world, or one of them from a very fat, rich family. Foreign Office, November 2nd, 1970. Dear Lord Rothschild, I have much pleasure in conveying to you, on behalf of His Majesty's Government, the following declaration of sympathy with the Jewish Zionist aspirations, which has been submitted to and approved by the Cabinet. And the British campaign in Palestine began the same week. His Majesty's Government view would favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use a home for them in Palestine, not their charter, 
and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement. And the, the minute the British got out, got, got there and Palestine, the man on the spot worked against them totally, and all the bureaucrats and the mandate, as it was called, hated the Jews and did everything they could to support the Arabs and stop Jewish immigration. We use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object. It being clearly understood, here's the caveat, that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil or religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by the Jews in any other country. Well, well, you see what I'm talking about? You didn't believe me, probably. How is that anything clear? That's totally, you know, Looks with favor, the establishment of a national home, not, 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 not an independent state. It being clearly understood that nothing should be done with, which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine. Well, all they have to start to protest, and that's the end of it then. Which is what happened. Or the rights and political status enjoyed by the Jews in other countries. The Jews in England didn't want their rights undermined, so that was put in there. So, so where's the clear charter? I should be grateful to you if you would bring this declaration to the knowledge of the Zionist Federation yours, James Balfour. That's it. That's the Balfour Declaration. <laughs> well, you know, Herbert would have thrown that back in five minutes and demanded a proper, a proper declaration. And he would have gotten it, too. He would have gotten it. With America, Brandeis, you see the kind of person Brandeis was, advising Wilson and so on, coming into the war at that point. He'd have got them. And a lot of people would have possibly been saved. He already got Uganda. He already got her off of Persina. Anyway, we taught Herzl what Zionism was. Poor Herzl grew pale. I didn't understand the rope is around their necks, and they say, no, yes, the rope was and is around our neck. Another reminiscence. A week after the vote, I traveled to London fourth class. Oh, well, good for you. <laughs> because there was no fifth. Who might swing? He's traveling fourth class because there was no fifth. He sounds like Paul talking about all the stripes that he took going around, you know, and uh, boasting of all the suffering that he went through. And uh, I went to Downing Street, where the British government is, was. And I, I was living in Whitechapel. That's where all the poor Jews, you want you to know where he lives, where all the poor Jews live in Whitechapel. It's where the Jack the Ripper murders took place and so on. I saw the director of the Department of African Colonies. Percy was his name. In my broken French, I tried to find out his opinion of the Uganda uh, plan. This Englishman of one of the noblest families in the country, and a religious Christian, said, if I were a Jew, I would not give one suit or one man for this cause. You can't exchange Palestine for some other country. I wrote about this to Herzl. I still have a copy of the letter. And the realization of this truth was for Herzl the greatest tragedy, but also his highest experience. I taught Herzl, you see. Thus he became an adherent of Palestine. It was no longer a question of a mechanical process of the transfer of people into an allegedly empty country, but an organic process. Then I learned what I have told you already, that the way does not come to meet you, nor does conception of Uganda was the way that, was that way would come to meet us. We young ones rebelled against it. We young ones would travel to the remotest corners of the ghetto. On a journey through Russia, I was at least seven times in prison. Yeah, here's Paul, exactly. I was seven times in prison, and I was beaten here, and so on and so forth. Where I sold a thousand shares of the colonial trust to a thousand Jewish families who paid them off with ten kopecks a month, we who had to execute Herschel's order as his faithful servants had to rise against our master when it was Herschel or Palestine. What came afterward has remained a lesson to me up to the present. I do not believe our work can be accomplished by technical and mechanical means borrowed from European technology and culture. Now Brandeis says just the opposite, if you remember. Uh, other peoples enforce successes for themselves by pressure and demonstrations by showing off their power. But our movement, these things count very little. So we're not going to demonstrate. We didn't demonstrate against the Holocaust. We didn't, <laughs> we didn't demonstrate against the closing of the American borders. We didn't do anything. Other movements do. We're not going to do that. This isn't Jewish, he says. To put it plainly, we cannot force the British government. We can only convince it. We can only convince it through an example of apostolic devotion to our cause. Easy gains you will not keep, but what you achieve with difficulties will be of permanent value. Those optimists who believe we shall gain anything by parades and demonstrations in which hundreds of thousands of New York Jews make a noise and demonstrate against Britain 
I'm deeply convinced that's the wrong way. <coughs> well, he's wrong. That's the only way. And that's what did happen in 1948 when the British left Palestine. Hundreds of thousands of people did march in New York City. And so, that's all I can tell you. This guy is as wrong as a hot hot. And they took over Herzl's movement. Maybe they were dedicated. One doesn't doubt it. One, one, one admires that. But their political sensitivity and sophistication is very, uh, very low level. It's un-Jewish, there it is, in its conception. <laughs> For it works with means it cannot be applied to our movement. Calculated to grow slowly and organically. See, our movement must be Jewish. It must grow slowly and organically. <laughs> This is when, 1927, 10 years before the, the, uh, Hitler begins his, uh, his uh, activity uh, in the war. I remember hearing Nordau saying four years ago, I refer to this without intention to plumbicize, 500,000 Jews will go to Palestine, 200,000 will fail, 300,000 will remain in the country. I've always opposed such an attitude. It's not Jewish. Well, it's better to go into gas chambers. Is that is that is that is that the point? What was wrong with what I was trying? So five hundred thousand will go, uh, three hundred thousand will stay. What's wrong with that? At least three hundred thousand are saying. You follow what I'm trying to say? But I'm thinking with hindsight. You know, you couldn't see that. It's not his fault, really. First of all, it's impossible. Second, the Jewish people would never agree to pay this price. That is not true. They would have. Uh, believe me, when I had the Balfour Declaration in my hands, I felt that the sun ray had struck me, and I thought I heard the steps of the Messiah, but I remember that the true Redeemer said to come silently like a thief in the night. I had to hold myself back, to put restraint upon myself. Moreover, I had to fulfill the bitter task of bringing the reality of the Jewish masses struck by a sun ray. Herzl's the sun ray. It's not pleasant. I could sing a bitter song. If you would come to the colonial office to negotiate, you would speak more meekly and perhaps be more modest than he who had to negotiate up until now. I said at the last Congress, I would not lead the organization for more than another two years. May he who will come after me be able after ten years to look back on a progress equal to what has been made these last ten years, so he said. We Jews got the Balfour Declaration quite unexpectedly. Or, in other words, we are the greatest war profiteers. We never dreamed of the Balfour Declaration. We quite frankly came to us overnight. You see, it didn't come for anything he did. It didn't come because he was a chemist. It came because of the work Herzl had done previously, because the British were a knowledgeable of the Bible, and they were Zionism in their religious expression. It came for reasons like that. But you know, just because it came unexpectedly doesn't mean you couldn't make certain demands. The Baltimore Declaration of 1970 was built on air, and a foundation had to be laid for it through exacting work each day, every hour, these last 10 years. I remember opening the newspapers thinking, whence will come the next blow? I tremble as the British government would call me and ask, tell us, what is this Zionist organization? Where are they, your Zionists? For these people think differently than we do. The Jews they knew were against us. We stood alone in a little island, a tiny group of Jews. Well, maybe that's true what he said. A great deal of educational work was necessary. Uh, an eminent official of the colonial office was president. We talked a great deal about the difficulties in Palestine. If you ladies and gentlemen believe that we can make light of these things in an optimistic elation at the bottom of that page 581, and if you say there are Arabs, but we must get rid of them, there is Britain, but we must force it, then you may be playing the part of a contrabass in an orchestra that will never make a song. But this I am firmly convinced. I do not accuse the opposition of insincerity, nor do I think they wish to do harm, but I am convinced they do not know this world. Well. And then he tells the Yiddish proverb about the Magid and the Yeshiva Booker and the Moshel and so on. You see the Arabs in the middle of page 582. Emerge from this war with three states in their hands and with a kingdom that stretches from the Euphrates to the Indian Ocean. And they demanded more. They wanted more, yes. And the article in the Los Angeles Times says that today. And today their king is in exile in Cyprus. Yes, but uh, that's only because the French 
threw him out, but there's still all these states. And then it occurred to me, a Lithuanian header boy, you see, I'm a poor little boy from the Jewish header. The one that if one grasps too much, one seizes nothing. And according to this maxim, I'm back that I never ask for too much. I just ask for a little. Well, he's noble. I'm not saying he's not a dedicated person, he is, but he's the wrong leader, the wrong time, the wrong place. The leader should have been Jabotinsky or Herzl or any of these people, but not, or even someone like Brandeis, but not him. Anyway, he is the leader. When I came to Paris in 1918, that's during the uh, Press Light Conference, we faced an iron wall. The military administration of Palestine and Downing Street were uh, 500 years apart. In other words, Downing Street is the government, but the military administration was against the Jewish settlement in Palestine. We had either to convince Allenby, if you've seen Lawrence Bravia, he's the British general, or to quarrel with him. And today Allenby is a sincere friend, so we didn't quarrel with him. Balfour, and people like that, devoted to our cause, as a result of our slow, systematic, lengthy, always difficult work. The story of our work among the Jews I need not tell you. You know it just as well. We have convinced everybody except the Jews, but we shall find it. So he says the Jews are, very, are not responding very well. Well, with Hitler in the wings, I think they'd have responded a little bit quicker, perhaps. And if they had it all ready for them, they might. Uh, listen to this last thing here. The, the, we're going to get Jabotinsky's uh, uh, report next time, uh, a reaction to the Palestine Commission. This is sort of like the Baker Commission now. <laughs> the British sent out a commission to see what they should do with Palestine, and they actually stopped immigration to Palestine after this in 1937. Now, when Jabotinsky appears before this commission, he threatens them. He says, you will not treat us like this. But when Weizmann appears before this commission, he breaks down and cries. Incredible moments in the history of, well, you guys are all critically interested maybe in the Jewish people, but I see you are, so incredible moments in the history of the Jewish people. Turning points. It's not easy to present a complete and systematic report upon the political situation. I'll try to finish this before you go. Months have to, have to pass before it's possible to take an objective view of the kaleidoscope changes and events. The task is especially hard for those of us, it's always hard or in the thick of the fight. 584. We are told the mandate. The British got the mandate from the League of Nations. By the way, notice here, 587. Just to show you, I'm not kidding you. This is one test for our great teacher, Ahad Am, who is with us no longer. It might have been the only one. So you see, Ahad Am is his great teacher. He makes that plain even if it's not Herzl. He teaches Herzl. Ahad Am teaches him. See the difference? He admits it. I'm not telling you the foolish nonsense. I'm telling you the truth about this. Sad as it may be. We're told the mandate's a complicated document, the mandate from the United Nations. I have my book, Islamic Law and Palestine and Israel. I go through all this stuff in that book. The Palestine Order and Council, the dates of these things. You're interested. That's a very good description of the, of the development of the legal situation in Palestine under the British after World War I. I recommend it. I work very hard on it. We're not the authors of the mandate. British statesmen, not the Jewish agency. The Jewish agency was that agency I told you was founded by Herzl to bring about this situation. It still exists. Call up Los Angeles. Look up the Jewish agency in the phone book. And there it is. I, I told one of the people in the class, you want to go to Israel? You want to get in the army there? You start with the Jewish agency. You don't even have to go there. You know, because they'll just run you around in Los Angeles. But you go to Israel and you'll be able to sort out, but there is a Jewish agency in Los Angeles. They have a department for this kind of thing. Anyway, the practice of many years has proved it complicated. What Jewish affairs are not complicated? The blame lies under the mandate. Now made escape to lies with those who should have carried out the mandate calmly. With strength and dignity. The British didn't, didn't keep their promises. The Royal Commission now itself suggests that it might have been easier to, at the outset to proclaim the Jewish state than to carry on the twilight of these 20 years. Well, that's, that's exactly right. The thing might have been carried through with one swing. There was no lack of understanding. 
even among the Arabs. Amir Faisal, who was cooperating with Lawrence of Arabia, uh, could speak for the Arabs. But uh, now it's the Mufti, the Mufti of Jerusalem, went to Hitler and was instrumental in helping convince him to do the final solution. Because the Mufti of Jerusalem was this horrendous uh, provocateur. Was, his name was Hajj Amin al-Hussein. His descendants are still uh, operating. Yasser Arafat was one of his um, relatives. Uh, and if you study the Mufti of Jerusalem, you'll find out that uh, he actually uh, went to Germany in the Second World War and went around uh, with Hitler's people, Gestapo people, and encouraging this to get rid of the Jews before they came to Palestine. People don't know much about that. You can Google all these people. See, Faisal was from Mecca. And Lawrence had picked him out as the leader. British to support. Now his descendants are now the kings of Jordan. They originally also became, uh, British gave them the part of the mandate they cut out of the Palestine mandate and made the country of Jordan out and gave it to the, the uh, descendants of uh, the sheriff of Mecca for services rendered in the First World War. Gave two thirds of the mandate away. And uh, I've told you previously, the mandate as it was uh, ordained after the First World War, there was enough room to solve the Arab Jewish problem. There's not enough room to solve the Arab Jewish problem when you cut two thirds of the mandate away and give it to a, a noble family, for, even though they are decent, for services they did to the British monarchy. The British also put the other person as king of Syria. The French threw him out because they didn't want him in there. They wanted Syria and Lebanon as a French zone of influence. So the British took him and put him in Iraq. And he became King Faisal of Iraq. British were in control of Iraq because they wanted, they needed Iraq because the planes couldn't get to India. They needed a base to land the planes on the way to India. And uh, they had to refuel in Iraq. They put this Faisal in. He survived as king of Iraq for a while, and then his children were massacred in the next generation when the uh, war, when the uprisings occurred in the 1950s that brought the Ba'athists, the Saddam party, into power. You can study all that. They were all killed. In any case, um, <laughs> this is a whole horrendous story, obviously. With Faisal, understood our aims. We were able to reach an agreement. You see, there couldn't have been. In 1919, 1920, there were other Arabs as well as Faisal with whom we could negotiate. And the Jordanian government is still pretty friendly to Israel, but doesn't want to undermine itself. It wants to keep the Palestinians in Palestine. Jordan shouldn't be considered part of the, uh, uh, of, shouldn't be considered the Palestine state, but in fact, it is the Palestine state. It should be the Palestine state. And the area in between should be uh, sort of uh, maybe some sort of extraterritorial situation. But now they want two out states from the Palestine, and they got one, and the world is prepared to do that. So the Jews uh, are looked upon as uh, recalcitrant, difficult. Faisal was with Lawrence and would have been willing to do that. If you haven't seen Lawrence of Arabia, you should look at it. Um, anyway, in 1936, it very nearly re relinquished even that attempt. The Arab extremists saw their chance, press on, and the English would give in. And uh, the psychology in place was the muftis. I probably have to... Uh, stop in a minute, but let me just show you here up to where Weizmann breaks down and starts to cry. Uh, this is a breach, 585, at the top of the promises made to us in our solemn hour to stop Jewish immigration and so on, which is what they're considering <coughs> because of Arab pressure. In the 1930s there was an uprising in Palestine led by the Mufti. I, for 20 years, have made it my life work to explain the Jewish people to the British and the British people to the Jews. I say to you, we have so often girded at me and attacked me just because I have taken that task upon myself. I say to the men for power, you shall not outrage the Jewish nation. You shall not play fast and loose with the Jewish people. Say to us, Frank, the national home is closed, and we shall know where we stand. 
But this trifling with a nation bleeding for a thousand wounds must not be done by the British as empire is built on moral principles. That mighty empire must not commit this sin against the people of the book. Tell us the truth. This at least we have deserved. Here Weissman breaks down and weeps and then continued after a pause. <coughs> no, that's not possible. You can't weep in front of the British government. <laughs> Can you imagine Herzl weeping when he gave his testimony or something at such a commission? Is this man going to get anything from them? Of course not. And that's what they do. They close all immigration to policy. Okay, my friends. <coughs> Next time we'll finish this up and we'll read Jabotinsky and we'll hear the other side of the coin. <laughs> this is quite an interesting subject, don't you think? But it's no good just monitor his thought. You have to throw the sign in man. Anyone who cuts the Zionism out of the class is just not doing justice to the situation of the Jewish people in the 21st century. Like Goldberg. Huh? Like Goldberg. No, I didn't say anything, and I don't want to be quoted. I don't say anything. I've never said a, such a thing. I've not said anything.